Good afternoon, everyone. It's just after one o'clock, so we're going to get started with the webinar. Um, welcome. We're very glad you could join us today. Uh, my name is Sarah Wilkinson, and I'm the research assistant for the Canadian Coastal Resilience Forum at the University of Waterloo. Um, we're, I'm really pleased to have been invited to co-host this webinar today with Kenzie Pulsifer. Um, she's the coordinator for the Climate Risk for Coastal Transportation Infrastructure Community of Practice um, at the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Um, so today we're discussing Canada's changing climate report, um, changes in the oceans and coastlines surrounding Canada. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the webinar presentation will be about 40 minutes today, and we will use the rest of the hour for question period, and that will be moderated by Kenzie. So if you have any questions during the presentations, please type and send them in the questions box, um, and Kenzie will make note of them for later on. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce to you our presenters. First, we have Blair Greenan. Uh, Blair is a research scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada and is based at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Halifax. He manages a diverse group of researchers that focus on strong or on ocean stressors ranging from marine oil spills to climate change effects such as ocean acidification. He is the scientific director for the Agro Canada program, which contributes to the international agro program in advancing global real time observations of the ocean. Uh, with autonomous instruments. Uh, and next we have Thomas James. Uh, Tom is a research scientist with the Geological Survey of Canada, Department of Natural Resources Canada. His undergraduate studies were at Queen's University and he carried out his PhD research at Princeton University finishing in 1991. Um, Tom's research interests are in geodynamics and specifically in understanding the interactions between the solid earth, ice sheets and glaciers, and the oceans. All right, so um, I believe Blair is beginning, so I'm going to pass it off to Blair. Uh, we're all ears. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Um, and welcome to this briefing on Canada's changing climate report. Uh, this report is the result of a collaborative effort between Environment and Climate Change Canada, Fisheries and, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Natural Resources Canada, and a number of university experts. There were a total of 43 authors to the report. The report provides a robust assessment of how and why Canada's climate is changing and what changes are pro projected for the future, covering changes in temperature, precipitation, and related extremes across Canada, changes in snow, ice, and permafrost, changes in freshwater availability, and changes in the oceans surrounding Canada. The report was released on April 1st of this year. And today, uh, Tom and I will be focusing on chapter seven of the report entitled Changes in Oceans Surrounding Canada. Maybe next slide. Doesn't seem to be working for me, so maybe, okay, thank you, Tracy. So, um, Firstly, Tom and I would uh, like to acknowledge uh, the significant contributions of our co-authors listed on this slide, along with the others who contributed content to the report. Next, please. Canada's uh, Changing Climate Report is part of a broader national assessment process being led by Natural Resources Canada. The CCCR, as we refer to our report, is the first report to be completed under this process, providing a climate science foundation for the forthcoming reports of the national assessment that will address impacts of climate change in Canada and progress made to adapt to climate change to reduce future risk and build climate resiliency. For the first time, the national assessment is emphasizing digital delivery of the full science content of all the reports through an external website at changingclimate.ca. Mm. PDFs fully compliant with the federal government requirements are also available on the NRCAN National Assessment website. So we would encourage you to, uh, to check out after the webinar if you uh, want to delve further into this into the changingclimate.ca website. It's very uh, easy to use and uh, user-friendly. Next slide, please. 
As a brief overview, this slide provides a snapshot of the overall scope and structure of our report. A narrative of the report's conclusions are provided through a set of 10 plain language headline statements, all of which have at least high confidence associated with them. <clears throat> the core chapters of the report each deliver a set of key messages. These are those chapter-based findings considered most relevant to audiences of this report and of the national assessment as a whole. The chapter key messages include statements of confidence in and likelihood of re results. Assessing the robustness of conclusion based on weight of evidence supporting them is a critical part of the science scientific assessment process. The scope of Canada's Changing Climate Report covers physical climate science, and in that respect is broadly similar to the scope of work under Working Group 1 of the IPCC uh, report, report series. But this uh, report focuses on the Canadian context. Next slide, please. In the next uh, three slides, we'll provide a high-level overview of some of the uh, key messages of the CCCR to provide some background context for the OCEANS chapter uh, in, in this uh, webinar. Warming in Canada is primarily a manifestation of global scale warming, which is driven by global anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases, in particular uh, carbon dioxide. As was reported in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, the increase in global temperature is mainly determined by the total amount of carbon emitted over time from human activity, what we refer to as cumulative carbon emissions. The resulting warming is effectively irreversible on multi-century timescales due to the long lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere and the inertia in the climate system. Both past and future warming in Canada is, on average, about double the magnitude of global warming. Canada is warming more rapidly than the global mean, and model projections show that this continues into the future, regardless of emission scenarios. Northern Canada has warmed and will continue to warm at even more than double the global rate. Next slide, please. The effects of widespread warming are evidenced in many parts of Canada and are projected to intensify in the future. Across Canada, data records show that these effects include more extreme heat, less extreme cold, longer growing seasons, shorter snow and ice cover seasons, earlier spring, uh, spring peak stream flow that is associated with melting snow and ice, rapidly thinning glaciers in many regions of the country, warming and thawing of permafrost, and rising sea level along many of Canada's coastlines. Precipitation has increased in many parts of Canada over the past several decades. The largest increase in terms of percentage change has been in the, in the north and during the winter season. Because of warming temperatures, less precipitation is occurring as snow and more precipitation is occurring as rainfall. Because some further warming is unavoidable, these trends will continue. Next slide, please. In terms of future projections, the rate and magnitude of warming under high versus low emission scenarios project two very different futures for Canada. The maps here illustrate this, and this for changes in annual mean temperature toward the end of the century. And you can see the stark differences between the two scenarios. The map on the right shows warming under a high global emission scenario that assumes continued growth in global greenhouse gas emissions. Large and rapid warming during the 21st century are projected under this scenario with profound effects on Canadian climate. The map in the center shows warming under a low global emission scenario. While warming in this scenario is clearly much more limited, it is nonetheless important to recognize that additional warming and associated changes in climate will still be experienced we are 
already seeing the effects of widespread warming in Canada at current levels of warming. Additional effects are unavoidable. It is clear that adapting to a changing climate is imperative. Next slide, please. Now, moving on to the content on the chapter uh, of oceans surrounding Canada. Uh, Canada's coastline is approximately 230,000 kilometers in length, with over half of that bordering the Arctic Ocean. The oceans off Canada generally have a relatively narrow coastal zone with embayments and shallow water. This extends outward from the coast uh, to continental shelves with a typical water depth of one to 300 meters, and then onto the continental slopes with depths increasing to three to 5,000 meters in the major ocean, ocean basins. What is presented in the figure on this slide is sea surface temperature climatology for the fall period in the oceans surrounding Canada. As you can see, there are large regional differences in ocean temperature surrounding Canada. And therefore, in the CCCR, we address the Pacific, Arctic, and Atlantic Oceans individually in this chapter of the report. Next slide, please. The first headline statement for chapter, for chapter seven of the report is that oceans surrounding Canada have warmed, become more acidic, and less oxygenated. This is consistent with trends observed in the global ocean over the past century. In terms of future projections, ocean warming and loss of oxygen is expected to intensify with further emissions of all greenhouse gases. Ocean acidification is projected to increase in response to any additional carbon dioxide emissions. These changes in oxygen, oxygen and acidification have the potential to threaten the health of marine ecosystems. However, changes in temperature could be both beneficial and detrimental and could lead to redistribution of marine species. Next slide, please. Upper ocean temperature has increased in the Northeast Pacific, shown in the upper right panel, and in most areas of the Northwest Atlantic over the last century. <clears throat> These trends are consistent with anthropogenic climate change. The lower right panel provides a summary of changes in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where heating of the, of the ocean surface, uh, indicated by the blue line, is resulting in, from increasing air temperatures in the ice-free seasons from May through November. The warming of the deep waters in, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, represented by the green and black lines on the lower panel, results from an increasing influence of subtropical Gulf Stream water being transported into this, into this region by the Laurentian Channel between Newfoundland and Cape Breton. <clears throat> This is a result of a changes in um, a northward ch uh, change in the subtropical uh, front that's pushing more subtropical water into this region of Atlantic Canada. The exception to the warming trend in the, in the Atlantic is the region east of Newfoundland and Labrador, where there has been no significant increase in upper ocean temperature over the last half century. This lack of warming is believed to be related to processes of natural climate variability in this region. In the Canadian Arctic, the upper ocean has warmed in summer and fall as a result of increases in air temperature and declines in sea ice. There are limited ocean temperature time series in the, in the Arctic, and those that do exist are limited in duration to a few decades, making it difficult to assess long-term climate change trends. Next slide, please. Because of the heat capacity of water is much higher than that of air, anthropogenic warming is expected to be somewhat less uh, than that in the lower atmosphere over land, except possibly in some places where there are changes in ocean circulation. Presented here is a sea surface temperature change 
pr uh, projected for mid-century relative to a reference period of 1986 to 2005 for the high emission scenario. Winter on the left and summer is presented on the right. Here we see that oceans surrounding Canada are projected to continue to warm over the, uh, through mid-century in response to both past and future emissions of greenhouse gases. The warming in summer will be greatest in the ice-free areas of the Arctic and off southern Atlantic Canada, where subtropical water is proje projected to shift north. During winter in the next few decades, the upper ocean surrounding Atlantic Canada will warm the most. The Northeast Pacific will experience intermediate warming rates and the Arctic and Eastern subarctic areas will warm the least. Next slide, please. There has been a slight long-term freshening of the upper oceans in most areas off Canada as a result of various factors related to anthropogenic climate change. Salinity has increased below the surface in some mid-latitude areas, indicating a northward shift of saltier subtropical water, as we had seen in the previous time series for temperature in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, Observations from the Arctic as a whole indicate freshening in most areas, but increased salinity in some others. Given the lack of data and assessment about climate change trends for ocean salinity in, our, in the Arctic is difficult. In the figure presented here, evidence is provided for a long-term increase in upper ocean stratification for the period of 1948 to 2017 with the rate on the Scotian shelf being about twice that observed on the, on the Newfoundland shelf. This trend in change in stratification is a result of long-term changes in both temperature and salinity in this region of Atlantic Canada. In general, these trends are consistent with, both, with positive trends in stratification observed for most areas of, over the continental shelves of Atlantic Canada as well as off the west coast of Canada. Next slide, please. In the global context, the CMIP-5 climate model projections suggest that subtropical regions with high sea surface salinity dominated by net evaporation will become more saline or, or salty as the century progresses. High latitude regions with lower sea surface salinity are projected to freshen over the coming century. Presented here is the sea surface salinity change projected for the mid-century, again relative to the reference period of 1986 to 2005 for the high emission scenario. Again, winter is presented on the left and summer on the right. What we see here is freshening of the ocean surface is projected to continue in most areas off Canada over the remainder of this century under a, high, under a range of emission scenarios due to increases in precipitation and melting of land and sea ice. However, increases in salinity are expected in the off-shelf waters south of Atlantic Canada due to the northward shift of subtropical waters. The upper ocean freshening and warming is expected to further increase the vertical stratification of water density, which will affect ocean sequestration of greenhouse gases, dissolved oxygen levels, and marine ecosystems. Next slide, please. In the Canadian Arctic, we have observed that surface wave heights and the duration of the wave, of the wave season have increased since 1970. And this is projected to continue to increase over, over the remainder of this century as sea ice continues to decline. Off Canada's east coast, areas that currently have seasonal sea ice in the winter are also anticipated to experience increased wave activity in the future as the seasonal sea ice du duration and extent decreases in a warming climate. A slight northward shift to storm tracks with decreased wind speed and lower wave heights off Atlantic Canada has been observed and is projected to continue in the future. Due to the challenge of modeling dynamic 
changes in, in global climate models, we have low confidence in this, uh, in this key message. Off the Pacific coast of Canada, wave heights have been observed to increase in winter and decrease in summer, and these trends are projected to continue in the future. Again, uh, challenging to uh, assess this, uh, this aspect of the climate. Next slide, please. In the next few slides, we'll focus on changes in ocean chemistry. Ocean acidification takes place after CO2 gas from the atmosphere is transferred into the ocean uh, and where it dissolves and forms carbonic acid. Increasing acidity or decreasing pH as shown in this figure of the upper ocean water surrounding Canada has been observed consistent with increased carbon dioxide uptake from the atmosphere. And the figure shown here, changes in ocean pH in three areas off Atlantic Canada are presented. Data prior to the 1990s is very limited, but overall we are, have observed a decreasing trend in pH, pH in this region. This trend is expected to continue into the future with additional CO2 emissions, with acidification occurring most rapidly in the Arctic Ocean. The rate of decrease of pH will be dependent on future on the future emission scenario, and it should be noted that ge geoengineering approaches that only limit warming and not CO2 emissions will not address the ocean acidification issue. Next slide, please. The oxygen content of the ocean is important because it constrains biological productivity, biodiversity, and biogeochemical uh, cycles. As the global ocean warms under anthropogenic climate change, a loss of dissolved oxygen is expected. The, re the reason for this in the open ocean is twofold. First, as the ocean temperature increases, the solubility of oxygen in that water decreases. And therefore, the ocean's capacity to hold oxygen decreases. Second, increased upper ocean stratification caused by warming and freshening of the surface waters, as we have saw on a previous slide, <clears throat> tends to reduce vertical mixing, and this results in a decreased supply of oxygen to subsurface waters. The schematic pre uh, figure presented here demonstrates that in many are areas of Canada, Canada's oceans, there is a decreasing trend in subsurface oxygen. In many cases, these time series are too short to assess the effect of climate change. Next slide, please. This figure presents oxygen data from some locations where we do have long time series. What we see here is that subsurface oxygen concentrations have decreased in the Northeast Pacific and Northwest Atlantic Oceans of Canada. Increased upper ocean temperature and density stratification associated with anthrop anthropogenic climate change have contributed to this decrease. And it is projected that low subsurface oxygen conditions will become more widespread and detrimental to marine life in the future as a result of continuing climate change. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tom uh, to talk about sea level uh, in Canada. Uh, thank you very much, Blair. Um, and before I proceed, I just want to check uh, am I coming through loud and clear? You are, thanks. Yeah, I am, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. So it looks like I also have control, so that's wonderful. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Tom James, and uh, for the remainder of the webinar, I'm going to uh, talk about the sea level component in the oceans chapter. Um, and so shown here on this slide, uh, is a headline statement related to sea level change. Coastal flooding is expected to increase in many areas of Canada due to local sea level rise. And I'll uh, provide a definition right off the bat. When we talk about local sea level rise, we're talking about the sea level rise that's experienced at a specific location on a shoreline, on a coastline, 
uh, that may be undergoing uh, vertical land motion, either uplift or subsidence, um, and that, that uh, if the land is rising, then uh, the local sea level is decreased compared to the global value, and if the land is sinking, the local sea level can be increased. And uh, for Canada, um, this uh, map on the right uh, shows the, um, uh, the, the cause of vertical land motion across much of Canada. Uh, the solid earth is still responding to the weight of the ice sheets from the last ice age. And uh, we'll have occasion to go into that in a bit more detail. Now, um, two uh, key messages uh, related to sea level in the oceans chapter are that local sea levels projected to rise and increase flooding and this applies to most of the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of Canada and the Beaufort coast in the Arctic. Um, so although by a percentage of uh, length of coastline, it might just apply to half of Canada, in practice this statement applies to uh, the, the majority of the coastal population in Canada. And then the second um, key message relates to sea ice, which I will not speak about very much today, uh, sea ice was discovered, uh, was discussed, excuse me, uh, in the webinar on the cryosphere, which was chapter five of this report. But the key message states that the loss of sea ice in Arctic and Atlantic Canada further increases the risk of damage to coastal infrastructure and ecosystems due to larger storm surges and waves. I'm going to uh, expand somewhat uh, on the uh, Canada's Changing Climate Report. I'm going to draw a few points from this earlier uh, report that is part of the Canada's Changing Climate series, uh, Canada's Marine Coast in a Changing Climate. I also want to uh, discuss um, questions about uh, projected global sea level rise and what an appropriate uh, high-end value might be. I'm going to drill into that question a little more as well and for that, uh, I'll refer to uh, some of the recent scientific literature. So uh, this slide shows two examples of coastal flooding and damage. The one on the left from the Sunshine Coast north of Vancouver in coastal British Columbia. And the picture on the right from Nova Scotia showing the, effect, the effects of a winter storm. Now, I mentioned uh, the important impact uh, or effect of vertical land motion on sea level trends in Canada. And that's shown in this slide, which on the left we have records of uh, from nine tide gauges across Canada. Uh, some of the tide gauges, uh, some of the records extending back to uh, 1920 um, and uh, extending up to the present. And we'll just uh, focus um, the uh, top uh, record is for Halifax, and the bottom record is for Churchill. So we have Halifax in Nova Scotia, Churchill on the shores of Hudson Bay. And you'll see that the sea level trend for Churchill sees, uh, shows uh, dropping sea level at nearly a centimeter per year, uh, while at Halifax uh, we have sea level rise. The, the tide gauge shows a, a trend of uh, sea level rise of over three millimeters. And this is related to the vertical land motion, which we measure with global positioning system. And you see that uh, a large part of Atlantic Canada, uh, the land is subsiding at one or two millimeters per year, while uh, Hudson Bay and a lot of the Canadian Arctic archipelago, the land is rising at large rates, uh, in some cases uh, exceeding uh, um, 10 millimeters or one centimeter per year. So it's this vertical land motion that is uh, that, that with uh, a global sea level change that it's those two effects combined that leads to local sea level. Um, I should mention that uh, in the projections of uh, the first of all in what we observe in tide gauges and also in the projections that I'll be showing other effects such as dynamic uh, oceanographic effects and uh, uh, long-range gravitational effects from the changing mass of ice sheets and glaciers are also incorporated into projections of local sea level change. 
So this shows projected global sea level change through the century. And so this is, if you will, the average uh, sea level change uh, averaged over all the ocean basins. And we're looking at projections for two representative, representative concentration pathways. RCP 2.6 in the blue uh, represents strong mitigation of carbon emissions, and we call it uh, a low emission scenario. RCP 8.5 is a high emission scenario, sometimes termed business as usual. And uh, for the low emission scenario, uh, the bottom of the, the bottom of this uh, envelope of uncertainty suggests that uh, we expect at least 25 centimeters of global sea level rise by 2100, while at the upper end of the high emission scenario, we project nearly one meter of sea level rise by 2100. But sea level projections uh, have a, a significant source of uncertainty because the dynamics of marine-based ice sheets are not well understood and are a uh, topic of very, very active study. Uh, and uh, the potential for uh, certain um, uh, feedback mechanisms to allow parts of the Antarctic ice sheet to provide larger amounts of global sea level it has actually been, a, it's been known and identified uh, for some time, uh, first raised as an issue in the 1970s, um, and uh, acknowledged in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC as uh, having the potential to contribute uh, uh, possibly additional several tens of centimeters of global sea level rise. Uh, in response to this, we developed and presented an enhanced scenario which uh, allows for this possibility of an additional contribution of sea level from Antarctica. We also recognize that the scientific literature allows for even larger amounts of global sea level rise, and I'm going to uh, address that uh, topic in a little more detail in coming slides. So taking that uh, graph of projected uh, global sea level change, uh, mapping in this vertical land motion, which I explained how that uh, affected the tide gauge trends. Now we'll use this land motion, uh, combine it with the projected global sea level change to make projections of local sea level change. So here's a projected, here's a map of projected uh, local sea level change. Uh, not shown for every coastal location because we're only showing projections for locations where there's a global positioning system measurement of vertical land motion. The warm colors correspond to projected global sea level rise. This is for a high emission scenario at the year 2100. And for uh, much of Atlantic Canada, we have uh, projected sea level rise in excess of 75 centimeters. Uh, British Columbia, sea level is also projected to rise, but in generally uh, slightly smaller than the maximum amounts that are projected for Atlantic Canada. And then the Beaufort coastline, <coughs> excuse me, again, because it's subsiding, we have projected lo uh, local sea level rise. In contrast, Hudson Bay and much of the Canadian uh, Arctic archipelago, sea level is projected to continue to fall. This is a consequence of the of the large amounts of land uplift that that region is experiencing. We can look at uh, projections of sea level change through the century instead of just looking at snapshots at a particular time. Uh, this shows uh, projected sea level change for uh, for low, uh, intermediate, and high emission scenarios. Uh, at four different locations, Halifax that is sinking, all the way to La Grande on the shores of James Bay that is rising at a very large uh, rate of 15 millimeters per year. So we see the largest projected sea level change uh, at Halifax, um, while uh, La Grande, uh, even the enhanced scenario, uh, projects a slight sea level fall by, by the year 2100. In contrast, at Halifax, the enhanced scenario gives more than one and a half meters of sea level rise 
before I address uh, the question of you know what might be an upper bound at sea level, or in other words, is the enhanced scenario uh, could values be even larger? Um, I want to first of all talk about the components of sea level projections that for which we have a good understanding, and, and for which the modeling is is robust. And one of the points that we understand well about projected sea level changes, that in fact, through to about 2050 or perhaps 2060, projections of sea level change don't differ very much from one scenario to another. And they also, uh, we don't think that the potential um, instabilities of the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, if they become active, we don't expect them to become active immediately, but rather toward the end of the century. So in fact, Projected sea level change for the coming 30 or 40 years is quite well known. Um, that's one component of sea level projections that we can say with some certainty uh, are that in the short term, they're fairly robust. The other um, component of sea level projections that is also a consistent um, a result of modeling uh, not just in the fifth assessment report of the AR5 as reported in our marine coast volume, but also in recent, uh, in more recent scientific publications, is that intermediate and high emission scenarios uh, robustly show that global sea level will continue to rise past 2100, and that for a high emission scenario, that continued sea level rise would be expected to amount to several meters over the next few centuries. Uh, in contrast, a low emission scenario has the potential to limit global sea level rise uh, to one meter or so. So that's what we can say um, uh, with some certainty about sea level rise. I want to briefly mention how uh, different countries have approached this uncertainty in the high end of sea level rise. Uh, this shows a compilation of sea level guidance that's available on the web. Uh, national guidance uh, produced by uh, various countries or in uh, one case by the uh, European Union. Um, and uh, what it demonstrates is that for a large number of countries, uh, the guidance is based on the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. For a few countries, uh, we weren't able to find more recent guidance, and in fact, they're based on an earlier, uh, an, an earlier report of the IPCC. Um, a few countries, such as Canada, New Zealand, and Singapore, uh, do provide a high-end case uh, that supplements the fifth assessment report. And then finally, uh, the United States uh, has taken a very different approach from most countries, and uh, in, in contrast to most countries that uh, uh, feature, feature scenarios with less than one meter of sea level rise, or in the case of high, uh, 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 a few countries that have a high end case uh, ranging from one to two meters of sea level rise, the United States has a range of scenarios from low to extreme, uh, ranging from 20, about 25 centimeters to 2.5 meters. So this is, um, in terms of uh, national guidance, most countries at the uh, one meter or less, a few up to um, one or one and a half, and then the United States has uh, a high and extreme scenarios for which very low probability is, uh, is, is assumed, but uh, do lie at two and two and a half meters. Now, um, looking at the uh, scientific literature, um, we see this is a, a graph of uh, extreme uh, or high-end uh, sea level projections um, over the past 40 years or so. And we can see that the largest amounts, again, are up around 2.5 meters. Um, some of these high studies uh, some of these high values are from studies that have been superseded. 
and uh, some of these studies uh, use methods that were given low confidence by the IPCC in the fifth assessment report. But in terms of asking what are the largest amounts of projected sea level change that are available in the scientific literature, about 2.6 meters uh, is, the, uh, is the highest amount. Uh, this figure is from a recently published uh, synthesis by Garner. So that, um, I, I wanted to uh, take that digression to, um, to talk about, uh, be, because in the Canada's changing, changing Climate Report and in our earlier report, we indicated the possibility of larger amounts of sea level rise, but we never indicated what that upper bound might be. Uh, and uh, so I provide this to show that it lies around 2.5 meters. Um, but that um, uh, some of the some of those larger values have been superseded by uh, recent literature. So, in my final uh, few slides, I want to briefly talk about extreme water levels and uh, make the link to uh, between changes in mean sea level and flooding events. This shows the Halifax tide gauge, and you can see looking at the magenta line here. Uh, in the 1920s through 1940s, there were relatively few flood events. Well, as we proceed through to the 2000s and 2010s, there are many, many more flood events. And this is a consequence of the slow rise in mean sea level. Um, and uh, numbers uh, showing that increase in flooding events were at different flood levels from 2 to 2.3 meters are shown in this table. Another way of demonstrating or considering the effects of a rise in mean sea level on extreme flooding events are to uh, do a somewhat more detailed analysis where we're now plotting um, high water events and uh, fitting a curve through it. And then we're asking the question, okay, here's a flood level that corresponds to a one in 50 year return period. So we, we would expect this flooding level to occur about twice per century. And then we can ask the question, if by 2050, sea level has risen by 40 centimeters, which is the upper end, uh, it's the 95th percentile of the RCP 8.5, uh, then um, that one in 50 flood event becomes a one in two year flood event. So with that, I'd like to summarize uh, our presentation. I'll first of all give three points about sea level and then uh, a summary slide on uh, the broader results of the CCCR. So first of all, um, two points about sea level that are actually quite robust and that we understand well. Sea level projections are robust through to about 2050 or 2060, and they don't strongly depend on scenario. Intermediate and high emission scenarios are projected to lead to meters of sea level rise over centuries. And then finally, Sea level projections at intermediate times, and so I'm sort of talking, uh, you know, beyond 2060, um, uh, up to 2100 and, and, and beyond, uh, there's a low probability, high impact potential for large amounts of sea level rise that could be larger than one meter at 2100. Uh, the largest projections for 2100 are around 2.5 meters, although recent scientific results would point to slightly smaller values. Um, to s continue this summary uh, of the oceans chapter, uh, there's strong evidence of human-induced changes during the past century in key ocean climate properties, such as temperature, sea ice, acidity, and dissolved oxygen. Uh, warmer ocean temperatures have contributed to declining sea ice and increasing sea level, uh, but there is regional variability. There's an area south of Greenland where there's been little ocean warming. In general, warming and freshening at the ocean surface is projected to continue through the century, and that will continue to increase stratification and reduce sea ice. Ocean acidification and decreasing subsurface oxygen levels uh, will continue, and that will have increasingly adverse impl implications for marine ecosystems. Uh, relative sea levels projected to rise for most of the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, and the Beaufort coast in the Arctic, 
and this will cause the frequency and magnitude of extreme high water level events to increase and lead to increased flooding. Declining sea ice co cover will also contribute to uh, more frequent extreme high water level events along Canada's Arctic and Atlantic coasts. Uh, the impacts of climate change, and this is a comment that applies to the CCCR as a whole, not just the oceans chapter, the impacts of climate change, such as warming water, ocean acidification, sea level rise, depend strongly on the pathway of carbon emissions. Strong mitigation of carbon emissions will minimize future effects of climate change. And so with that, I thank you, and uh, we open, uh, open the door to questions. And I'll just comment that these two uh, links, uh, the link at the top is for uh, a user, uh, an interactive uh, web page uh, that uh, show, gives the entire report, and the bottom link is a traditional uh, PDF document available at this URL. And with that, uh, thank you, and I think we open for questions. Thank you so much, Blair and Tom, for the presentation. This is Kenzie Pulsifer speaking from the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, and I'm going to be moderating our question period. We have had quite a few questions come in, so we'll start with this first one from Daniel. Daniel asks, does the CCCR address changes in wind speeds and particularly extreme wind speeds? Uh, it's Blair here. Uh, thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, in in uh, the chapter on uh, chapter seven on oceans, we did look at assessing uh, the literature on available on changes in uh, rain, storms, and winds uh, in the areas off Canada's east and west coast. Um, and as I uh, stated in the presentation, it's it's uh, very challenging with uh, with these data sets, as well as with any sort of modeling of uh, dynamic processes with with uh, coarse scale climate models to uh, to de determine that whether there had been significant or statistical changes in extreme events. Um, so, uh, at you know, at best we can say at this point is that. Um, you know, due to a change in the atmospheric uh, circulation in global climate models, is an expectation that the jet stream will move slightly northward, and and that we're seeing in a trend in a slight northward shift of storm tracks in Atlantic Canada, um, but change in intensity or magnitude of those storms, we have not been able to, you know that that isn't evident in, in the literature as it exists. So, uh, you know, the models do much better at assessing changes in thermodynamic properties. So as the uh, atmosphere warms, it's able to uh, hold more water vapor. Uh, for every degree of warming, you can uh, have about 7% more water vapor in the air. And so the expectation will be that, um, because of, there is more water vapor in the air, that uh, extreme precipitation events uh, will become more common uh, as we move forward. Um, but the intensity of wind speed, uh, extreme wind speed, is not, uh, we can't say anything very confident about that change. I hope that answers your question, Daniel. All right. Hopefully the next one is from Helen, and she asks, what are the units of change for the ocean salinity and density stratification mean SSS change? Uh, okay, so um, ocean salinity, um, in the past in the community we had used something called practical salinity units, but the community has moved away from that, and so salinity is presented with as a unit, unit, uh, unitless quantity, basically it's a, you know, it's a uh, parts, you know, it, it's a measure of the fraction of of salt content of of the ocean. So it's unitless. Um, and density stratification, 
is in units of kilograms per meter cubed per meter. So I know that's confusing, but it's basically the change in ocean density per meter uh, of the ocean. And the way we typically present ocean stratification is we do we take a measure of ocean density uh, at the surface and then a measure at 50 meters below the surface. And it's the difference between those two uh, measures in seawater density at over the 50 meter, uh, top 50 meters of the water column. And uh, as that stratification increases, what happens is you get lighter, more buoyant water at the surface if stratification is increasing. And that makes it harder to basically turn over the water column or mix it. Um, and so that's why when you have increasing stratification, you have a reduction in, um, in things like uh, transfer of oxygen content from the surface to subsurface waters because it's harder to basically mix or turn over that surface water column to, to mix oxygen from the surface down to the subsurface. Great, and then there's a question from Terry, and he wanted to know what the time frame for the projection uh, from the slide on relative sea level change. He wanted to know what was the time frame for that. Yes, um, it's uh, the projections are through to the year 2100. Um, one of the things we're <clears throat> we're presently um, having some discussions between federal colleagues and provincial and territorial colleagues about uh, uh, the advisability of developing uh, national sea level guidelines. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that we would consider, that we should consider, is uh, providing guidance beyond the year 2100. Uh, and in addition, having a fairly uh, a fairly careful thought about uh, the issue of uh, high-end scenarios and how we might want to deal with that. But what we've shown today, with the exception of the one slide that went through the year, went through to the year 2500, that was the slide where I was making the point about um, uh, continued uh, meters of sea level rise for intermediate and high emission scenarios. Uh, everything else that I've shown today uh, stops at 2100. Okay, great. Uh, next is a question from Jennifer. Uh, oh, no, sorry, from Andrea. Um, Andrea asks, are the charts showing climate adjusted flood return periods included in the CCCR? Hmm, are the chart, yeah, uh, this is Tom speaking. Um, it, Kenzie, do, do you know which slide this question applies to? I think it would be the one on extreme water level. Right. Yeah, okay. And it might be. So um, I wonder, do I have control? Because it might be worth backing up. Yes, okay. Great. So both this slide is uh you know this is uh, uh this is a record of the halifax tide gauge um running up to about 2015 or 2016 and and also okay i was ah uh, there we go very good and this um this slide which is based on an earlier analysis the the work was actually published in 2009 it's based on the historical record um so no uh potential changes in storminess or um you know for some parts of uh, atlantic canada changes in sea ice uh you know they would not be taken into this analysis um, now, I might hand it over to Blair um, to remind us, uh, you know, what the projections are uh, for storminess um, in Atlantic Canada. Yeah, well, Tom, as, as I said a little bit earlier, the, the projections for changes in storminess are highly uncertain in Atlantic Canada. Um, there is, I guess, in, in terms of past um, changes, there has been some uh, observation of increase in uh, fall 
storms in eastern and Atlantic Canada, but no change in other seasons. Um, again, it, you know, future projections for that are highly un, uncertain at this point. Uh, th thanks, Blair. So I I think you know given uh, given that uh, the I guess that we could say the lack of robustness in terms of the uh, what the modeling is showing. Um, I think that these uh, uh, these two slides that are based on the historical record, you know, they're an excellent first cut towards understanding the effects of sea level rise on uh, on flooding events. Um, you know, given this example from Halifax. Okay, great. Uh, next is from Anuja, um, and the question is: Has there been research on the extent to which changing climate affects fisheries on the Atlantic coast? Uh, it's Blair here. Um, so this is that's a bit outside the scope of our report, which basically dealt with the physical science. But I, you know, I'll, I'll attempt to. Uh, provide some answer to that, not complete, I don't think. Um, there certainly, you know, is ongoing research on the effects of climate change on fisheries. Um, and in, in DFO, um, we undertook uh, an internal uh, risk assessment in 2012 and produced a uh, technical report, which is publicly available. I, and if Anuja would like to email me, I can send her back the link for that report. I was quite extensive and looked at, one aspect it looked at was the effects of climate change on, on various fish uh, stocks and species in Atlantic Canada. Um, that's a, you know, a little bit out of date now, um, but it would certainly provide a synthesis of the literature up to the point of that report in 2013. Uh, now, uh, sub following the CCCR, there are going to be other reports in this assessment series, one of which is on national issues, and uh, fisheries is a will be a component of that report on the economic sectors in Canada. Um, so uh, I think that Elizabeth can correct me if I'm wrong here or not, but uh, you know that report should be out within a year or two, uh, and that will provide more of a, an up-to-date assessment of of research uh, on climate change effects on fisheries. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from Ken, and he asks, do the current models incorporate thermohaline cycle changes over time as it relates to influences of heat transfers from south to north? and the influence of isostatic rebound as continental ice pack continues to melt or coastal subsidence due to permafrost modeling. Let me know if you need me to repeat it. <laughs> so uh, th this is Tom. Um, and I think I, I kind of see two parts to the question. And Blair, do you want to take the first bit about thermohaline? And then I'll try to say something about the isostatic rebound. Uh, so, you know, current climate models do incorporate um, thermohaline circulation. Um, you know, they, but the ocean component of those models is quite coarse. And uh, in assessments, if we look, let's say, specifically at the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation cell in the North, uh, in North and South Atlantic. Um, when uh, we've looked at those uh, model outputs from the uh, from the assessment report five, the CMIP five models, they do not do a very good job at simulating um, the past um, uh, past historical record of of the AMOC, and so we don't have a lot of confidence that uh, they will be able to project well into the future. Um, and that's basically due to the computational limitations of these models, because they are using such a coarse resolution in the um, of probably about 100 kilometer grid cells in the ocean component. Um, they just cannot capture the dynamics properly uh, for that. And I'll turn the rest over to Tom. Okay, uh, thanks, Blair. And so the the second part of the question, 
was asking about uh, the influence of isostatic rebound as continental ice pack continues to melt, and then also mentions coastal subsidence due to permafrost modeling. And so, um, our so so first of all, I guess that the sea level projections are uh, based on uh, measured uh, vertical land motion, and then what we've done is try to be fairly careful about the influence of present day ice mass change so that we don't sort of double count as it were when we make the projections. So so that that that's how that bit works. Um so I think the 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 short answer is that yes we are um we are appropriately taking into account <coughs> excuse me uh present day and recent ice mass change. And then coastal subs the question about coastal subsidence due to permafrost um mel melting um and and there uh you know those effects are uh so local um and can vary dramatically depending on the nature of the subsurface um and there's been no attempt made to uh um to take those effects into account uh the g p s sites that we use for the vertical land motions uh in nearly all cases are uh mounted on bedrock or on uh, masonry buildings uh, that we think are very stable, uh, buildings that have existed for uh, many decades. So we think the foundation has stopped settling. Um, and in a few instances, such as Tuk Toyuk Tuk, uh, the GPS site is mounted on a, uh, a, a hydro pole that is uh, um, that was inserted into a borehole and then frozen into place in the permafrost. And uh, that monument appears to be quite stable. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Tom and Blair. I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, is it okay if people that still have questions can email both of you? Definitely, okay? yes. Yeah, okay, so great. If, if there are any other questions or if there's any questions that we didn't get to today, please feel free to email Blair and Tom. Um, and thank you again to everyone who came and listened with us today. And thank you, Tom and Blair, so much for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.